conference of the SPLM conference for peace, reconciliation, forgiveness in the United States of America. Comrade Lado Jada, the chair of the SPLM chapter in the United States of America. Comrades, members of the SPLM in the United States of America. Uh, good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Welcome to America. We came as a team under the leadership of our first vice president, Taban Dengai. We came here so that we come and attend the UN General Assembly meetings. meetings. which is a conference attended by all the countries in the world. We came to share the world body on how we move forward, making this world a peaceful place for us to live on. Where, where there are a lot of problems, we need to resolve these problems. Share uh, each other's experiences and support each other's so that we resolve the problems facing the people on the planet. <coughs> and uh, I will not be uh, the speaker here, because the invitation was given to us, but he's about leader here that will be addressing you. But I would want to congratulate you for holding this important uh, conference. And I am moved a lot by the words I've heard from Colonel McCabe and the other and the spirit with which you welcome us. Well God made it made this today be to this day be, be the day when we will meet. Uh, could have taken place some, some days back or some months back, but God made it to be this day. <coughs> Otherwise, if you were to record it a week ago, we would have found a chance, put me a chance, such a chance would have, have been available for all of us here to be meeting here. Uh, we We have uh, uh, disarmed me, preempted me of what I would have said. I found that you, you will know more than I know on the issues of peace, reconciliation, how to build a nation. And therefore, I will not even need to to repeat what you, have, what, what you already know, to tell you what you already know. Yes, we have been fighting one another, but we have been consigned to people of South Sudan, but in 
because of the difficulties of livelihood. We have been fighting one another as individuals and as tribes. We have never been one country with only the British that came and demarcated the area and we were not consulted of what South Sudan was going to be. The British found us disorganized tribes without central authority. And we were not even known, we have not even called South Sudanese. The West Sudan itself, we never gave it to ourselves. It's a foreign word. That means we didn't have a name. That means we never existed as a nation before the Europeans went to Africa and divided Africa. <coughs> amongst themselves. Otherwise, the word Sudan itself was applied to the <coughs> land of the black people, black Sudan. That is extended from West Africa, from Senegal, down to the east, up to Ethiopia. It was still a deep name known by the color of the people that were there, Sur, black Sudan. And when the colonialists went to Africa. Then it was again divided to Francophone uh, Sudan and Anglophone, Anglophone Sudan. But after when countries, uh, the colonialists again decided to divide their colonies into areas for the purpose of easy administration. And so they kept out some of the areas and gave them names. So the rest of the countries, of the people, they got their names. How they got them, we do not know. But we came to remain, we remain the name Sudan. Uh, and Sudan, of course, uh, for the first time, for us to come under one, one administration known as Sudan, was the British that made us to be, to be part of the Sudan. But we were not united as people of South Sudan. We were only tribes also fighting one another. The British, they, they did their level best to organize us. <coughs> Divided this into three, three provinces of Upper Nai, Barbizel, and Pretoria, or in Pretoria, Barbizel, and Upper Nai. And each of these provinces were divided into districts. And the three districts were divided into court centers. And that was all. Because there was no means of transportation, we remained. Uh, separate. Because the roads that brings people together, the roads, means of transportation that connects people and make it possible for people to make trade. And through the trade, people come to know one another and, and therefore exchange, exchange what they have and maintain peace because they will come to know that without peace, they will not be able to trade amongst themselves. And you know the governments <coughs> in the world, they first developed along the coastal area where there was transportation. And people saw the need for them to maintain peace and therefore governance started from the coastal areas in the whole world. So the absence of transportation could not make us discover ourselves as people of Sudan. It was only the British as a colonial master that used to bring salt and bring this. That was the person, the, the body known to us. And they had the power. They were able to punish people and enforce law and order. When they, they never got a chance to open schools for us. And also we resisted even going to school. 
the British tried they never passed all these rules for us but our people resisted the missionaries came and give the level best develop the languages and, and, and uh, so that the religion is taught in our own languages <coughs> few schools were open during the British few church schools then few secondary schools intermediate schools and then there were Rumbek secondary school and Juba commercial secondary school these were the schools left by the British, only two secondary schools. And then, so then we came independent. Again, our masters were the people of Northern Sudan who were educated. Who got the chance of being educated through Egypt? So there was University of Khartoum, that is Gordon Memorial University College, that uh, was able to educate the Northern Sudanese. And also, so went to, some went to Egypt, attended the university in Azhari University. And therefore, there were the people who came and, and, and claimed and worked for the independence of Sudan. When the British left, we were surrendered to the, those groups who became the Northern Sudanese. And they assumed the, the role of the, the, the several people, what the colonialists were doing. They were doing worse than that. They had their own agenda. So we never ruled ourselves as South Sudanese. We had been ruled by the British and again by the Northern Sudanese. And because the, the, the Northern Sudanese, because of our land, beautiful land, the resources we have, they wanted to have access to this. And to have access was first to, to Islamize the country. And the theory of Islam, they say, if you, are a, if you speak Arabic and you, you are a Muslim, then you are an Arab. So this was the policy they wanted first. And then they say Islam has no borders. That means the resources of South Sudan become the resources of, the, of all the Muslims. Feel like what is happening in Iraq and Iran, where you have the ISIS. They went there to fight for Islam, not for Iraq, and creating, creating a new nation. Where everybody becomes a civilian, you don't talk again of your tribe or your nationality. <coughs> you are Muslim, that's all. And therefore anybody can go to can, can rule them. This is what they wanted to do. So they wanted, they were keeping us divided and we've been doing more to divide us. So then we only come to respect them all, know them, meet our brothers and sisters, and that's all. So it is that the strategy of divide and rule kept us divided. Even when South Sudan became, uh, had a, a self-rule after the signing of the, the Addis Ababa court, we, we, we started well, but later on again we differed. And that is what was that is the division of the South into three regions. Even those three regions, they could not also remain united. The issue of the Kokoro started from Equatoria. The Equatorians demanded for the for, for Kokoro. The people of Argaza would go away, Panak would go away. And when South was divided, the same was done. In Apanak, they went and chased the Equatorians who were there, who were even born there a long time ago. The same in Barak with us, chasing the people of Apanak and the people of Equatoria away. So we went divided. And the only united, united uh, the power in the body that united us was the Sudan government. We were ruled or headed by or managed by the people of the north. 
question with the architect of the division of the South. Again, when I differ in our own state, but when I differ among themselves, they say, no, we don't want money to We want to be divided because these people are bad and these people are bad. So there was Western Equatoria, Eastern Equatoria, and Central Equatoria. And the same was replicated also in the rest of the states. People in the north, the rulers in the north, were happy to see the south disintegrating. It would be easy now for them now to rule and have access to their resources. So, brothers and sisters, comrades, we have no, we never rule ourselves for the culture. Governance itself is a culture. It's a culture that is inherited. And they say a son of policeman will become a policeman. A son of a, 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 a trailer will become a tailor. And that's what I do. We are no, we are not a government before. And this is the cause of the differences. Even who is inside, who is in the tribe itself. Because of the poverty we are in, we have not been maintaining peace. We have been also raiding each other and, and fighting one another within the tribe itself. So it is an issue of poverty. The British, who ruled the Sudan for 58 years, from 1980, 1898 to 1956, 58 years, ruling the Sudan, they didn't do anything, they could not even build the roads. They did very little. There were challenges, and I thought I'd be telling them that should have been the people to advise others they know what exactly what the problems of South Sudan are. We are just like any other people in the world. Now there is no employment in the South. And, that, and, and it can't be. The private sector is not developed. In the culture, people were using the traditional tools for farming and they were producing very little. And this is why they resorted. When these crops they failed, then it's, they choose either to starve to death or to go and steal. And to go and steal, if you don't, I don't, I can't, I can't make it. Then I have to arm myself to go and rock. So it is the difficulties of survival. In America today, I know how America is maintaining peace. Because those who are unemployed, the government takes care of them. And the standard even something called social security funding. In Britain, they do it like that. In the case of South Sudan, those who are not wealthy, who are not giving them anything. And if they don't get anything, what do they do? Either they choose to die, to starve to death, or they're going to steal. Because maybe nobody will give them, give them, give them anything. Uh, and therefore, when I'm a, a minister, then I find my, my, my relatives coming home <coughs> to my house. And my salary would not be enough. So uh, this is where corruption comes in. In order to maintain the people who are in your own house. And punishment also is difficult. Accountability. Because the arms are in the hands of the people. And you get hold of somebody. These people with rights that are being targeted to take up the arms and fight. Agitation goes in. A lot of things. But just like any other person in the world, we know what is bad and what is good. 
world's never stop, and they will continue to be. These arms that are being manufactured, what, what, what for? Because they want to remain strong. We'll try to live in peace. But the law of nature will not allow us to be forever. What will have to be? Now people talk, say, don't kill. This is what the religious says, don't kill. But what are we doing now? I will not kill that. Did God tell us to give us, to authorize us to kill others? Bombs are made, aeroplanes are made. And people are bombed here and there and there. So our problem is, is poverty and lack of experience in government. And government can, that experience can help you have it, theoretically. You have attained it. But practically, to apply it, it cannot be handled with that. So we fight, as people of South Sudan, we fight. We fight, we reconcile, and that is what we have been passing through. We fought, we disagreed, we fought among ourselves, but we reconcile. And this is why we are here today as the first vice president. Yesterday we have been fighting one another. But we come now to reconcile and accept ourselves and let us and we build our nation. So I just want to tell you the reason we are moving together is to tell you that we are united. Now your your role, and I'm happy to say that let us stop hostile propaganda among ourselves. Pain. It is a war, war we are fighting in the media. It's what is mobilizing America to be against South Sudan. It's what is mobilizing other part people in other countries. We will tell things that never happened, exaggerating situations. I uh, sorry for having taken such a long. I didn't want to go further, but. I wish we were to remain here for a day, two days, so then we can say what we want, what we want to say. I apologize uh, if uh, maybe that I've taken a long time. And uh, it have, should have been the Comrade Kabandeka, the first vice president of the, of the Republic of South Sudan, to greet you. Give you what you wanted to give or the words of encouragement. Uh, Sika, Sika.